presentation by, um, and I'm gonna, unfortunately, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to move kind of quickly through this so we can fit everything in. But we're gonna start off by talking about the difference between real news, it's over there on the whiteboard, objective, real news that is biased, satirical news, and fake news. So I'm gonna give you some examples. That's what those handouts are, and we have them up here too on the uh, projector here. Um, and so we're gonna decide, I have an example of each one, and so we're gonna go through those articles together and decide which category they fit into. But before that, do all of you have the crap test? Okay, so this is, um, you can also find this on the library website. It's a really good resource for evaluating websites. And today I'm just going to focus on the ones that are um, of particular interest in discerning whether something is fake news. So um, one of the things we look at is authority. Is this an authoritative source? How many of you think the New York Times is an authoritative source? It is, right? So just because a certain autocrat doesn't like the news it's reporting doesn't make it fake news, right? So we're, what we're gonna do today is tell the difference between those different types of news. So who, what are the credentials of these organizations? Can I contact them? Can I verify this information? Do they verify the information? Is it accurate? Is it correct? Has it been reviewed by an editorial board? Um, and then the purpose, what is the purpose? Is it just to objectively portray the news? Is there an agenda here? Is it sponsored by an organization that has an agenda? So those are the types of questions that we're gonna be asking as we go through these different types of news sources. So some of you may have the handouts, others don't. I'm gonna um, move to this one right here. So if you would take out your handout, breaking Antifa gang attacks elderly white woman as she exits church. I'm gonna just talk you through it. Some of the articles are longer, so we just don't have time to read this in the session. You can look through it on your own, but I'm gonna point out some features for you, and then we'll vote on what we think it is. Does anyone need a copy of this handout? Okay, so Paul, can you hand this? Thanks. All right, so um, we're, let's look at the headline, Antifa Gang Attacks Elderly White Woman As She Exits Church. You should be thinking about why Antifa is called a gang and why they emphasize an elderly white woman and the fact that as she exits church. If you scroll down here and you look a little further here, you can see that Antifa, that the mainstream media remains silent about a liberalist terrorist organization and that their goal is to make white people pay for electing Donald Trump. Then you'll see that the article declares it is a civil war against white Christians. And the source cited, there is a source cited, but the source cited is according to local news reports. Right? If you flip to the back, it says uh, that Antifa has promised violence and a week of rage. And then the final declaration is, arm yourselves and be careful, folks. Does this seem like a credible source? Okay. What are some of our clues that it's not? So it doesn't verify sources? Yeah, what else? Right, it's very designed often. So how many of you think this is real news objective? Okay, how many of you think this is real news, but it's biased? Okay, how many of you think this is intended to be satirical? How many of you think this is an example of fake news? Yeah, so this is our fake news source, and one of the ways you can tell is we also, you know, there's no credible information cited. It is designed, it's a heavy appeal for those of you who have studied rhetoric. It's a heavy appeal to pathos without any logos or logic backing it up here. And so the rhetoric is designed to incite anger in the audience. Notice it ends with a call, a call to arms. 
So that is indicative of fake news. Those are some of the signs that we can tell it's fake news. All right. Uh, the other one article is much longer, so I'm going to um, just talk you through certain points on that. OK, so the next one we want to look at is about, uh, so we've got two articles about climate scientists. Um, so this one um, is from the Heartland um, organization. So it's climate scientists arrested for fraud. If you need a copy of that, um, go ahead. So one of the things, and my projector just went off. So <laughs> yeah, so you should ask, um, you know, uh, it's by Tiffany Taylor from the Heartland Institute. Um, so does anyone know what kind of organization that is at all? Okay. Well, I looked it up. You don't have time to look it up. If we were in a class, I'd have you look it up. But the Heartland Organization is an organization that is committed to challenging the idea that climate change is a, a very real problem and that it's human caused. So uh, they uh, noticed that climate scientist uh, David Alonghi has been indicted by the Australian government on charges of defrauding taxpayers um, out of this amount of money. Um, and then uh, they say it raises serious questions concerning the credibility of his research. Um, the, one of the evidence they cite is um, Anthony Watts. And Anthony Watts has a popular climate website called What's Up With That? Um, and he is concerned. Now, this is a website, if you don't know, that is very similar to the Heartland Institute that really challenges the idea that climate change um, is human-caused and is a serious problem. So it goes on to cite a US House Committee science technology report about the investigation to a, another professor's nonprofit research and think tank. It cites a complaint filed by the Competitive Enterprise Institute and Cause of Action within the Eternal Revenue Service requested the tax agency to investigate this scientist. It cites Mark Marino, who is a publisher of Climate Depot, that scientists can be tempted by money just like any other profession. Okay. So um, does it seem, uh, first, does this cite sources? Yes, it does. Are those sources uh, necessarily objective? Well, I told you they had a certain agenda. The Heartland Institute has an agenda, right? Um, uh, so, but it does cite specific sources. It does point to the problem. What seems to be the purpose of this article, other than reporting the news? Exactly, right. So it's questioning the climate science research and whether they have an agenda, okay? So how many of you think this is real news that is objective? Right, yeah. Not really, because it only presents one side of the issue, and it's very slanted, right, to cause us to question climate scientists, right? So I would say because it only presents one side of the issue, and it has a clear agenda given what the Heartland Institute wants to do, I wouldn't call this objective news. How many of you think it's real news, but it's biased? Right. So I would say that's what it fits under. I, I don't doubt that this really happens. There's a lot of specific details. If you remember the other article, only cited local news sources, and it never gave you anything specific. So that was clearly fake news. Here we have specific details. We have things that uh, sources mentioned, but it has a clear political agenda. So this is, uh, I think, a good example of real news, but one that's biased. All right, and I'm going to let them just continue to work on that. We're going to go to the next one, and this is going to be our uh, longest one. Um, so this is climate scientist admits to lying, leaking documents. So raise your hand if you need a copy of this one. All right. So uh, first of all, we have our source is the science, and it's NPR. Does anyone know what NPR stands for? National Public Radio. What kind of reputation does National Public Radio have? Yeah, it's generally known for having a neutral point of view. 
Um, I myself listen to it because I often get both sides of the issue and I get expert testimony. So this is a similar topic as the other one. It's not the exact same scientist, but it's a, client sci a climate scientist admits to lying and leaking documents. Um, so uh, this was heard on, it's actually a transcript from a radio broadcast on All Things Considered, uh, which is an NPR program. And so it starts out telling us about Peter Gleck, um, who is uh, a UC Berkeley PhD with a MacArthur Genius Award, and he is an, also an outspoken proponent of scientific evidence that humans are responsible for climate change. So he would challenge something like the Heartland Organization, who would say that humans are not responsible for climate change. So if you read what he did, it says, earlier this week, he confessed that he had lied to obtain internal documents from the Heartland Institute. That's who we just had that news article from before, a group that questions to what extent climate change is caused by humans. Gleck's deception has shaken the scientific community. So he lied, not about his research, right, but to get to internal documents. The other, by the way, the other article, the, the, the scientist was accused of taxpayer um, fraud. Does that necessarily make his research lacking credibility because he fudged some money on the accounts, right? doesn't not logically follow that that would necessarily make his research invalid. Um, this guy, again, uh, he just, he, I wanted to get eternal documents to find out what the Heartland Institute was up to, so I lied. Okay, so he's in trouble because he lied. But it goes on, if you read through here, notice what it cites. Um, it cites the president of the American Geophysical Union um, uh, at saying what Gleck admits to. If you go to the second page, um, I'm going to skip a couple of paragraphs. Gleck this week wrote in the Huffington Post that he suffered a serious lapse of my own professional judgment and ethics due to his frustration with attack on climate science from places like Heartland. So you get the point of view of the person who lied. Then you get the point of view of scientists who are shocked, like Michael McFadden from the American Geophysical Union. Um, and then he questions, people will look at this and say, oh, you know another conspiracy in the climate community. You also get the point of view of a climate analyst at the University of Colorado who says, I wouldn't go that far. For most people, it's very much like inside baseball, he says. It's a dispute among people and organizations that are really outside the public view, right? So do we have credible sources being cited here? Yes. Yeah, we have scientists, we have their credentials, we know where they teach. Do we have different points of view being represented here? Yeah, we have someone saying this is a big deal, it's casting doubt on our research. Someone else saying no one really cares that much. It's just like insider baseball. So that continues um, throughout the article. And then if you look on the last page, you get Naomi Oreskes, who is a historian of science at the University of California, San Diego, saying maybe that it's not such a big deal. The documents that were released last week essentially affirm what we already knew, and the deception was not necessary because this information is actually available through entirely appropriate means. So he didn't have to lie, but we already knew it anyway, so it's not a big deal. And then you get the president of the Heartland Institute, President Joseph Bast, who is upset about it and says that kind of invasion of privacy is taken really seriously. It has no place in this debate. I mean, what kind of ethical code allows for the invasion of privacy of individuals like that. So you clearly get those different points of view from different parties involved. The scientists, the president of the Heartland Institute, and scientists saying it is a big deal and it isn't. So how many of you think this is real news objective? Yeah, so this is a perfect example. We have cited sources, we get multiple points of view. We don't have that rhetoric you know, th that we had unless it's quoted by someone expressing their point of view that we found in the other articles. All right, the last one that we're going to take a look at is by The Onion. And this is really short, so I'm just going to go ahead and read through this with you. Let me just... Uh... So if you need a copy of that one, go ahead and raise your hand.
All right, so a little bit of background here. Um, DeSantos, if any of you have watched the uh, news um, recently, um, is running for governor, um, the Republican candidate in the state of Florida. His opponent is African American, and he said if his liberal opponent um, ends, uh, wins, uh, that we can't afford to monkey this up. And so people accused him of racism because his opponent is African American, and they said it was a racist dog whistle. Okay. Now, the source is the onion. How many of you have heard of that source? Okay, so a lot of you already know this. If you haven't, well, we're going to talk through it, and then you can tell me what you think. So facing backlash for warning voters not to monkey this up and vote for his black political opponent, Albert Gillum, Republican gubernatorial candidate Ron DeSantos held a press conference Thursday to clarify that his comments were intended as a subtle enough dog whistle to racist that he could escape blame. Many of my critics on the left fail to understand that my words were simply meant to fly under the radar and reach an intended audience without repercussions, said DeSantos, lamenting that his code words caused a media firestorm when his only objective was to target a specific bigoted group that agreed with his message. This whole media outcry is frankly overblown. People are acting like I threw out an actual racist slur when what I actually said was a harmless piece of rhetoric that's been used to dehumanize black people for centuries. If anything, folks should be upset that monkey up isn't a real idiom. DeSantos concluded his press conference by issuing an apology to Major Gilliam and his family, followed by a sly wink. All right. So what category does this fall into? Satirical. Okay, how can we tell that it's satirical? Yeah, because we know most politicians, qualify that with most politicians, wouldn't blatantly say, yes, it was a racist dog whistle and it was designed. I'm upset that you figured it out, right? <laughs> so, uh, so we can, and the, if you know anything about The Onion, if you like satire, um, so is it real news? No, but what's the difference between satirical news and fake news? What's fake news trying to do? Right. Exactly. Well put. That's very articulate. And what is satirical news is objective? Exactly. So um, you shouldn't take it seriously, but it's not intended to, whereas fake news is trying to pass itself off as real. So, all right. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Paul Knox from the English department here, my colleague in the English department. And he's going to talk to us about fake news often turns into viral memes. So he's going to talk to us about that. And um, you need this, don't you? Well, you need it. All right, so uh, I guess I shouldn't start talking to you. So my uh, talk is designed to be 10 to maybe 15 minutes long, but it looks like we might be missing a, pre a presenter. Oh, he's here, so I will then not extend it to make it an hour long in true academic fashion. So as Professor O'Brien um, said, I want to talk to you about memes. How many of you are familiar with the term meme? Cool. How many of you feel pretty confident that you know the definition of the term? All right, and how about the background, where it came from, why it's a thing? All right, so it looks like I've got a little something to tell some of you, and the rest of you I just get to bore you, which is sort of my goal in life. So a basic definition of memes from the Oxford English Dictionary, a meme is a cultural element or behavioral trait whose transmission and consequent persistence in a population, although occurring by non-genetic means, is considered as analogous to the inheritance of a gene. So the basic idea here is that some ideas propagate through our culture according to patterns and techniques that are similar to the ways in which genes get passed on or more specifically into the, into the ways in which viruses pass through our culture. Uh, Richard Dawkins in 1976 wrote the book called The Selfish Gene where he was trying to explain inheritance. 
Richard Dawkins is a prominent biologist and science journalist or science advocate. He has also recently been involved in a number of questionable activities in the skeptical community, which is unfortunate, but nonetheless, he is still one of the major forces in the development of, of uh, memes. Dawkins tried to explain in his book the way not only that biological traits pass through a population, but the ways in which ideas pass through a population. And he then invented, or at least created, the neologism of a meme. And he defined memes, or he provided examples of memes, as tunes, ideas, catchphrases, clothes, fashions, ways of making pots or building arches. Just as genes propagate, by them, propagate in the gene spool, pool by leaping from body to body via sperm or eggs, so memes propagate themselves in the meme pool by leaping from brain to brain via a process which in the broad sense can be called imitation. And he advanced this idea in the mid-70s. About 30 years later, another prominent um, academic by the name of Susan Blackmore wrote a book called The Meme Machine, where she took Dawkins' ideas of the meme and tried to carry them to their, their logical conclusion. She argued that if we take memetics, or the studies of memes, seriously, then the me that could do the choosing is itself a memetic construct, a fluid and ever-changing group of memes installed in a complicated meme machine. The core of Blackmore's argument is that memes actually influence and control our, our brains. She goes so far as to argue that our brains were constructed or evolved to propagate memes. This is the major evolutionary um, force on our thinking. Memes have a number of features. The first and most important feature of a meme is that it must be able to replicate itself and transmit itself. So you must be able to share an idea across space and time. Another characteristic of a meme is that a meme has to be able to change over time. This is an example of the why you know guy meme changing from its initial form in the upper left-hand quadrant of your screen all the way down to its appearance on a birthday cake and a magazine um, cover. What's worth noting about this meme, and one of the reasons I chose it, is because it highlights that memes often deal with racist and or pejorative themes, especially when they get wide propagation. If you've heard of Pepe the Frog, you will know what I'm talking about. This is an unfortunate but necessary point about meme theory to acknowledge, that they're often turned to negative or socially unacceptable ways. And finally, memes like genes travel together, which means that if you have one meme you are much more likely to like and to have encountered the other meme. And we don't know really why this is the case. A professor at Harvard generated a decision tree for, for forecasting meme success. And she did this by looking at something like 499 memes. And the 178,801 permutations of those memes that, she's, that she was able to find on a popular online meme repository. And what she found is that if a meme is to be successful, it must be passed on consistently over time. Memes that peak in popularity, think gel bracelets or swatches, tend to disappear rap rather quickly. Memes that are perpetuated over time succeed and retain, remain part of our culture. Meme theory has a number of critics. One of the more trenchant is this gentleman, Luis Benitez Rebisquia, who is a professor of oncology for the Mexican government. He writes that while genes are well defined in their molecular structure, uh, sorry, but while genes are well defined in their molecular structure has been extensively investigated, memes are ethereal and cannot be defined. Without an adequate idea of these elusive elements, it is no surprise that no scientific demonstration of such an immaterial replicator exists, and serious scientists disregard memes as the basis to explain consciousness and cultural evolution. Memetics is nothing more than a pseudo-scientific dogma where memes are compared to genes, viruses, parasites, or infectious agents thriving in their own survival in the human brain. And so we have 
uh, experts in the field of genetics and the propagation of viruses effectively saying that this theory is inherently flawed because it cannot answer certain uh, features. All of this ties back to the discussion of fake news because when we're talking about memes, you'll remember the number one point is they must be transmitted over time. And social media provides a way to do this. Susan Blackmore, in her book, uh, in a Wired interview she gave a couple of years after writing her book, said that the news media has huge, huge power to spread a meme because it's the major mechanism of copying. Memes are using human brains as their copy, copying machinery, so we need to understand the way human beings work. A lot of us want to be the first with a great new fashion, so once something exists, uh, gets onto CNN, you know you've missed the exciting, I'm up there with the trendy stuff moment. And if we were to take CNN and change it to Facebook for today, we would start to understand one of the vectors by which um, fake news propagates and why it propagates so rapidly. Because on social media platforms, there are few critics or censors that will limit the transmission of these memes. They are just replicated based on how much somebody likes them. Why is this significant today? It's particularly significant today because memes that, are, uh, that reinforce certain narratives that people like gain traction and then become part of the discourse. So back in the last presidential election, there was the drunk Hillary meme going around. And even today, there is the Hillary as crook meme that is circulating everywhere. So memetic theory ties back to the idea of fake news by giving us a way to explain why some of these ideas propagate. And even though it may be deeply flawed in its analogy to viral vectors and to disease theory, at least insofar as it's describing what's happening online, seems to be largely accurate. And with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Eric, <laughs> whose last name I don't know. There's a mic and everything. All right. Probably won't need that. Oh, for the recording. Got it. Was there a pointer that went with this as well? Uh, I can live without it. I can live without it. <coughs> uh, no, I can do without it. Well, good afternoon, and a big thanks to Kathleen and Paul for getting things going. My name is Eric Harala. I teach ESL, and to get us started, I'm just going to play a really short clip. For those of you that are familiar with The Matrix, you might recognize it. This is your last chance. After this, there's no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. OK, so my piece of this is the effect on writing in the classroom. and. Uh, this is usually what my students look like after I tell them <laughs> that they have to write a six to eight page research paper. And you know, I'll give you the, the same choice that, that Morpheus gave Neo. Uh, this is your last chance. 
There's no turning back after this point. Take the blue pill, college hour ends, you wake up in your bed like nothing ever happened. Take the red pill, you stay in community room three and deal with this until 1.15. So, looks like most people took the red pill, which is good. Uh, so just a summary of what to expect. Uh, first, I'll talk a little bit about the impact on student writing when I first started teaching uh, an advanced composition course for ESL and some of the writing and concerns that I was seeing from students. Oops. Uh, after that, I'll talk a little bit about how I changed my teaching process to help students get the tools they need to write uh, better papers. And lastly, I'll look at some uh, examples of student writing that improved because of that process. Now, you might be wondering, what the heck does the matrix have to do with fake news? So, if you're not familiar with the film, the basic premise or the plot of it is that digital technology, the matrix, a digital platform, is used to hide the truth and take, make, people a prison of their, make people a prisoner of their own mind. And so when we look at fake news and memes and things that are floating around, I see a lot of parallels. Uh, fake news is you know, using technology to hide the truth, misrepresent it, and kind of control the way people think. So that's, that's the connection there. So a little bit of context uh, about the population that I teach. So the ESL student population here at American River is one of the largest in the state. It's pretty diverse. I see a couple of my students in the audience today. Uh, and we get a pretty wide range of students in our classrooms that can range from people uh, that maybe have very little high school experience, because maybe they had to stop going to school to go fight a war, or maybe they had to run from a war so they couldn't finish school. That's one side of the continuum. On the other side, we have students that have their PhD in astrophysics. I had one last semester, and that was, that was her degree. I felt dumb just sitting next to her sometimes. But I helped her with her English. Uh, so that being said, the context of the course um, and the demands for writing 340, once our students kind of make it through our program, they're pretty sophisticated in English. But the one area where they still really struggle a lot is critical thinking skills. And that's kind of how I think of the red pill. If you take the blue pill, Life's easy. You just cruise through. You keep doing whatever you've been doing. You don't have to really think critically. Whereas if you take the red pill, it's not a lot of fun. You have to really develop critical thinking skills. You have to take your brain to the gym and do lots of working out. It, it's not a lot of fun. But I think those are the type of tools that really um, help us as educators and also help students uh, get to the place where they can evaluate sources critically kind of like the way that uh, Kathleen pointed out, and write better papers. So ESL students, uh, many times, again, they're sophisticated in English, but they may still struggle in terms of thinking like an American. Knowing the language is one thing, but learning how to think like an American is another. And it's not my job to teach them what to think, but it is my job to help them find different ways of how to think. Uh, so I don't want them to disregard anything they've learned in the past from their own culture, but I do want them to add to it. And that's a big challenge uh, in that class. So the other challenge where this really comes to a head is uh, their first research paper. And Kate Williamson, one of our librarians, um, you may know her if you ever go over to the library, uh, pointed out that, you know, I get a lot of students come into the library and they say, hey, I've got this idea. This is what I think about this topic. I kind of know it from A to Z, beginning to end. Can you help me find sources that'll help prove that point? I'm paraphrasing here roughly, but I get students that come to me and want to do the same thing. Uh, the problem with that is that research, if you already know all the answers, there's no need to do research. If you already know, you know A to Z, how it works, there's no need to do research. I mean, it's kind of like a criminal investigator that thinks, hey, I'm pretty sure this guy did it. 
I just need to go find the evidence that proves that he's the guy. Instead of following the evidence wherever it may lead, even if that's somewhere that they didn't expect. So that's where I end up spending a lot of time with my students. Um, so I think this is true not just for ESL students, but for all students is really evaluating sources critically. It's a lot of information. It's a difficult skill. It's difficult for me, and I've been doing it uh, for quite some time. Um, the other area, as was touched on in uh, the presentation before me, uh, is people sometimes have difficulty acknowledging and refuting opposing ideas. They think it makes their argument look weak. Uh, so, ooh. Skip forward, that guy's everywhere. So um, just you know, off the top of your head, what's your guess in terms of what do you think a lot of ESL students choose as their topic for their first research paper? And keep in mind, this is usually the first time they've ever written a full formal research paper with APA or MLA citation. So what do you think might be a general topic that's common? Politics, education, health? Any guesses? Education. Education. Education's one of them. That one comes up quite a bit. But I'm going to hand it off to Morpheus again with the whole meme thing. Um, who knew that he was so deep into the anti-vaccine controversy? Um, so this one comes up a lot. I get a lot of students that want to talk about this topic and write about this topic. And as you can see, Morpheus kind of plays both sides of it. Okay, so they find this information out there um, and sometimes present it to me as part of their research. Um, so there's plenty of snarky comments when it comes to this stuff. Okay, fortunately, my students usually don't present this to me. Um, and there are other ones, other memes that use you know, emotional appeals and even babies. Uh, some of the more serious ones that have been presented to me, uh, they, they're not so humorous. They look like, hey, there's, it's got numbers. This must be official. Okay. Um, anybody see a problem with this image? It, the problem I see is a, a pretty common one for a lot of people. It's confusing correlation with causation okay, over time. So for research papers, when I first started teaching the class, this is kind of a general procedure I followed. I inherited this from uh, another instructor. I don't think there's anything wrong with this procedure. It just didn't work with the way I did it. So this is pretty common. It's probably familiar for a lot of you. you choose a topic. You do a little bit of research up front. Um, narrow or broaden your topic as necessary. Develop a preliminary outline. Evaluate your source material. Um, write a rough draft and then get some feedback on it, turn in your final edit. The problem area for me on this one is evaluating your source material. Okay, it's pretty far down the list. What I started doing was front-loading this because I saw so many problems that arose from students waiting to do this until later. So uh, this is an example of a paper I got when I first started teaching the class. And this was on uh, vaccination. So due to the well-known fact that immunization can lead to side effects such as physical injuries, intellectual retardation, or death, it's not fair to force parents to perform medical procedures that can end with such harmful effects to their kids. And the support that the writer used for that um, came from a doctor who used to work at the CDC and is no longer with the CDC. And this was a very controversial a piece of evidence that was disputed and later retracted. The other piece of evidence she used was uh, from another doctor. So it sounds like a pretty credible source. It's a doctor. Right? But this particular doctor, after I went in and you know, really looked at the source and some of his credentials, um, it wasn't very credible. So the other thing that this student completely left out was the, um, the connection to autism. Okay? And that's kind of central to the whole controversy, is do vaccines cause autism or not? And she totally left that out because I think she felt that it would weaken her paper. Okay? 
So in order to uh, start addressing these kinds of things, I, I changed my procedure. So the way I revised it is I kind of front-loaded all of the things that students would have to do in terms of really critically evaluating um, sources, okay, kind of like Kathleen showed you to begin with. So I started that with a topic proposal. Um, and this allowed me to kind of see where the student was going and see if they had any biases to begin with. Um, after that, the one that really helped was research reports. Um, and all of this is done before the student even does um, an outline or starts writing. Okay, because if they haven't picked good sources, the rest of the paper is going to suffer. Uh, so the research reports kind of allowed me to see if they were choosing appropriate sources and also uh, to kind of shape their, their research and take it in a certain direction. Uh, library visit, some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, I hadn't been using the library up to this point, and going there and actually getting in a library and embedded in my course was very helpful. Um, and it was also just good for students to hear it from another person. That you can't, you know, just say, oh, according to Google, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So, um, and last, a list of sources. This one was really key in terms of, I know I'm pointing over here, but hey, it's over here too. Um, this one was really key in terms of the peer review piece of it. When a student is writing about a topic that they really care about, I found it hard for, even for myself, I find it, sometimes it's hard to be objective. So what I would have them do is gather a list of sources and then have their peers review it, have their fellow students review it. And a lot of times this gave them really different information and um, opened their eyes to, to things that perhaps they hadn't seen before. Um, then I went into the outline, detailed outline, first draft, and final edit. And I give them video feedback on all of that before they write their final edit. Um, so going through that process uh, yielded better results. So this is an example from a student paper, same topic. And when she first started this topic, she was a little on the fence, kind of leading towards, I'm pretty sure vaccines aren't good. Um, and you can see is highlighted, you know, her reason for choosing the topic and also um, kind of her not sure about where she stood on it. She wants to know whether the benefits of vaccination outweigh the risks um, in order to find out if there is a link between vaccination and autism. So this gave me good information right up front that she was kind of on the fence. So the research report, again, the purpose of it is to kind of guide students pretty early on. Um, and the benefits helps begin the process. It's a pretty long process for any of you who have written a, a research paper. Um, also shapes the direction of the research and flushes out any biases that they may have to confront later. And we've all got those. Uh, so I kind of break it down into topic, source, and summary. So this was her topic. Pretty simple, her source, and this was the summary she gave me of that source. Uh, the other thing that I ask students to do in this process is to um, tell me the main points of the article. It's similar to the summary, but they're kind of re restating what was really important to them. And last, any questions they might have. And this is a pretty important piece, because uh, we can see here that uh, this helped guide her to a, an article that was really key uh, for her research. Okay? She states, I want to find the evidence about the study that led to the connection between vaccines and autism. Okay? This is the piece that, in the example I showed you previously, the student completely left it out, didn't even address it. So her first argument. Vaccines should be obligatory because severe reactions to immunization are extremely rare. So you can see through this process and really evaluating sources early on before she started writing, getting feedback from her peers on those sources, uh, it really changed her whole direction and how she thought about the issue. Okay, so she followed the evidence instead of following what she already believed in. So the support she used for that, and you don't have to read the whole thing unless you're a speed reader, uh, but the highlights 
is she used some pretty good arguments to support that idea. Um, even though food allergies are more frequent, people don't stop eating new or uncertain foods that could cause them to have a bad allergic reaction. So why are they afraid to be vaccinated? Okay, so her argument's pretty solid throughout this. Uh, she also had a pretty good concluding sentence uh, for that argument. So doctors want to bring our attention that even if there are risks, um, the risks are minimal compared to some of the, the things that can happen if we don't vaccinate children. So her counter argument, this was kind of her, her coup de grace, kind of the highlight of her paper. And this is where she brought in the study from Andrew Wakefield. If you're not familiar with him, He's the guy who started the whole controversy. Okay, it was his paper, I believe it was published in The Lancet, that started the whole controversy. She found that article and used it as a source. Uh, so her refutation of that counter argument uh, was people who are against vaccination cover their position by narrative stories which are not proved scientifically. Parents react strongly to narrative stories because tragic stories affect parents' emotions in a negative way. However, on the other side of the spectrum are a number of scientific studies that have not shown any vaccine autism relationship. She used several quotes from those studies. I don't have time to go through all of them. Um, so, refutation two, this was the part about uh, Wakefield. Um, and she cites the study and then uses it to show um, that, you know, even though he, you know, the paper was retracted, he lost his license. Even though all these bad things happened to him, this myth still seems to circulate among our communities. Uh, but she did a pretty good job of acknowledging this other source and incorporating it into her paper. So, my takeaway from this um, is in terms of what you do before you start writing is pretty important. In terms of really evaluating sources critically, I can't say enough about that. And I think uh, Kathleen did a pretty good job of showing us fake news, biased news, and, and real news. And just doing that up front is a real time saver. It makes my job a lot easier once I get papers from students. Uh, and also, I think, again, it's not, it's not a lot of fun to do critical thinking and really critically evaluate stuff. Um, but it's really what we need to do in order to um, write better papers and have adequate support for them. Uh, so I might be at the risk of finishing a little early. Um, we went through that pretty quickly. Uh, at this point, you're probably asking yourself, why did I take the red pill? I should have taken the blue pill. Um, but at any rate, I would just encourage all of you, whether you're a teacher or a student, yeah, take the red pill. Do the hard work. Analyze the stuff critically. Um, even if it's something that you think is really you know, far beyond um, what you originally thought, it's good to challenge your own biases, that's how we grow. Um, on behalf of Phil Smith and Kathleen O'Brien and um, Paul Knox I, and everyone else that's involved in the colloquium, I would just like to say thank you. Uh, and yeah, take the red pill.